Well, um, I just want to start with a picture um, up on the screen. Thanks, Murray. Back when we were looking really hot, back when Leanne and I were looking really hot. Leanne's not here today, she's with her dad, who's uh, sort of on his homeward journey to heaven one of these days, but he, they're spending time together as a family today. But uh, look at that beautiful wife of mine. How blessed was I? And that was us 32 years ago on the 15th of August 1990, uh, 1990, Leanne and I stood on top of the World Trade Centre. And then two years later, it turned out, I only found out this week actually, as I looked at one of the dates, we got married on that exact date in another building, Ashgrove Baptist Church. And just at our recent holidays, we celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. Um, an anniversary, oh yeah, yeah, great, That's, thank you. Um, an anniversary I have never forgotten. Probably because my birthday is the next day helps. And that's it. Well, today's date is the 11th of September, a date etched in most people's memories, at least if you're probably over the age of 30. Um, 21 years ago, on the 11th of the 9th, 2001, the Twin Towers came crashing down because planes flew into the buildings, killing 2,996 people, injuring 25,000 people. It was an act of terror fueled by hatred and the desire to spread fear. And instead it ended up starting what is called a war on terror. And today the fallen are being remembered from 9-11. This week on the 8th of September another event took place that will be remembered. Our oldest living monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, died. She served for 70 years under, with 15 prime ministers who served under her, from Winston Churchill, who moved on from his earlier concerns, saying she's only a child, to saying all the film people in the world, if they had scoured the globe, could not have found anyone so suited to the part. Right through to the current British PM, Liz Truss, who she formally appointed two days before she died, an act that confirms the Queen as a servant leader who overcame fear and frailty to fulfil her duty and calling to the end. The Queen's death has sort of captured the hearts of people around the world. It's clear she was well loved and respected by many, as seen in widespread mourning. But maybe the mourning isn't only just for the Queen as a person, but also who she represents. She's a mother, a grandmother, maybe a calming presence in the world. With so much loss in, in, in recent years, maybe all who have lost loved ones are mourning again. And there is mourning for the loss of her servant leadership, a contrast to so many narcissistic leaders in the world. She seemed decent and kind and finished well, and we know that she claimed to be a follower of Jesus, particularly every Christmas, and I... I loved what she finished last year's Christmas, her final Christmas message with. It is the simplicity of the Christmas story that makes it so universally appealing. Simple happenings that form the starting point of the life of Jesus, a man whose teachings have been handed down from generation to generation have been the bedrock of my faith. His birth marked a new beginning. As the carol says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. You know, I was wondering how to preach today in light of like, these two big moments in history which I was thinking about. And, you know, 9-11, an act of, to bring terror and spread fear, and the death of Queen Elizabeth II, who seemed to overcome fear with her faith. And it got me thinking about the kind of legacy we want to leave um, as people and as Christians. To be remembered as someone who allowed fear maybe to hold them back or to, to, to cause damage in this world, or as those who overcame fear to live by faith, to build others up, to bring the hope and life of Christ in this world. You know, life is, is full of challenges, and therefore there will be many reasons, many times, to be afraid. And God knows this, which is why, as Lloyd um, Ojalevi said, there are 30, 366 fear not verses in the Bible, one for every day of the year and one for even the leap year. God wants to help us overcome fear every day and every year. 
Fear is a, a natural response to danger, but fear can also be dangerous when it takes preference over faith and holds us back from entering into what God has for us. Which in some ways makes fear, at least our response to it, the biggest threat when it comes to leaving a legacy that passes the life and wisdom of Jesus to another generation. Fear was the reason Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. Twelve spies were sent out to check out this promised land, land promised by God to the nation and brought back a report that it's a good land. But ten said, no, the inhabitants are too powerful to defeat. And Moses in Deuteronomy 1.28 says, Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large, with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. The Anakites were sent, said to be giant men. Um, in Numbers 13, 33, it says they, were thought, they, were, um, they thought they were like grasshoppers in comparison to these giants. And they believed they were descendants of the Nephilim in Genesis, a race of giant men from which probably Goliath came. Ten of the twelve spies were so afraid that in Numbers 14 we discovered they wanted to choose a new leader who would take them back to Egypt. How's that? When it comes to the crunch, fear overwhelmed faith to the point that they would prefer slavery again to freedom. But there were two spies that didn't let fear silence them and hold them back from going after what God was offering them. They saw the challenges, but they also saw the promised land promised from God. Joshua and Caleb were their names. They were ready to go and trust God to give them what he promised, but the fearful disobedience of the majority meant they would have to wait. Fear really has a way of spreading in a way um, of sabotaging the purpose and potential of many if we let it reign. It would take 40 years, but eventually Joshua and Caleb would be the only two of their generation to enter. And Joshua would lead the nation to conquer, and Caleb, well, there was something special for him. If we fast forward to Joshua 14, after much of Canaan had been conquered, as Joshua lead them, they began, Joshua began dividing up the land to the 12 tribes of Israel. And let me just read these voice, verses today. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land, and I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said to Moses, said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old, I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out into battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but with the Lord helping me, I'll drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. Three times in, in this passage, a phrase is repeated about Caleb by Caleb, that he followed the Lord his God wholeheartedly. I mean, wouldn't you love that written on your headstone, on the plaque about your life one day? Put your name there. He or she followed the Lord wholeheartedly. 
Caleb and Joshua were the only two still alive who came from Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land. They were the two spies who didn't allow fear to overcome faith. They had told Moses that we can take those Anakites because God is with us. And now they... And now here they stand, the, the aging leader Joshua and his old mate Caleb. It must have been a sight. It must have been quite a sight. And Caleb says, I'm 85, and I'm still as strong as I was 45 years ago. I'm ready to fight now as then. Caleb had been robbed of a fight. For 45 years, this fire had burned in his heart as he dreamt about taking out those giants that were living in Hebron, the land where Abraham dwelt, where the Lord visited, where they were buried, and the land promised to his children and their children, this holy land. He imagined it being desecrated, and he wanted it back in its rightful ownership. You know, I'm sure there was nice, flat pasture land in Canaan, Land already conquered, a much easier retirement plan. But Caleb was single-minded and he stepped forward first. Give me hill country, let me take out those giants. I want the hardest land and the biggest enemy. I mean, you've got to love it, don't you? I'll bet the younger Israelites had huge respect for this guy. And I'll bet they're inspired by him. I mean, half-hearted people don't tend to inspire others, but what a role model. I want to be like Caleb, wholehearted like Caleb. Do you get it? We've got men and women here in this church in their retired years who have followed the Lord wholeheartedly, and I know them, and they still have that fire in their hearts. They're still fighting the good fight. You know who you are. We have huge respect for you. And you can probably think of people, parents, others who have wholeheartedly chased after the Lord and didn't give up despite the challenges they faced. Praise God for the Caleb's that have influenced us to live wholeheartedly for God. And now we have an inheritance to claim for the next generation, and that is worth being wholehearted about. What we can learn from Caleb about being wholehearted from God. What can we learn? I mean, if you're under 85 here today, this is for you, this message today. If you're over 85, look at the Queen. <laughs> She's a good inspiration for you. This is for everyone today. God said in Numbers um, 14, 24, my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. Caleb's different spirit is what caught the eye of God. I mean, he was different to the many who lose heart for the Lord and shrink back in fear. And there's three lessons we can learn from Caleb about being wholehearted and claiming the inheritance God has for us. The first is that Caleb immersed his mind in the Lord. This passage is almost entirely Caleb speaking, and you need to notice who features in his words. I mean, Caleb mentioned in his short speech, the Lord seven times. Other translations say it's nine times, but the NIV translates that as he. Um, who was on Caleb's mind? The Lord was on Caleb's mind. And that made all the difference when he encountered the problems and the challenges which were enormous for him. Rather than face them with fear, Caleb was able to face them with faith. And it's not as if he denied that the problems were there. He said the Anakites were in the land, these giants. He mentioned the big problem once, but he mentioned the Lord nine times. I mean, what would a transcript of our thoughts reveal? Nine to one, the Lord over problems. Nine to one, problems over God. I'm not sure my problems to God ratio has been anything like Caleb's. I don't know about you. But it clearly was the secret to his heart being full of courage to go and claim that hill country. I was trying to think of how to illustrate how this makes a difference by immersing yourself in God and his word. And I thought of fishing, only because I was up at Fraser recently. And, uh, you know, I, and I just thought about how the right gear makes a difference. You know, I love a sunrise at Fraser Island, going out in a winter freezing cold morning, 
casting out the ocean, trying to catch fish. And uh, it's beautiful. But you know, it's freezing cold. And uh, you know what makes all the difference is a pair of waders. They're not a great fashion statement, but they work really well and they keep you warm and they keep you dry. You, it's just like you're in your doona in bed, you know what I mean? You, you, I've got trackies on and thick socks and jumpers and I'm out there fishing and I'm warm and it's comfortable and it's great. Even though the water's, water's turbulent, even though it's freezing, even though it's, there's wind blowing and all the rest of it, waders sort of make all the difference. And then you're able to stand that water, go after that fish. I met a guy by the name of Bill from Coolum every morning in the gutter. And uh, I lost a big fish, but I think he caught it. And he pulls in this massive Jew fish. And I was thinking, that was my fish. But it was almost as great celebrating with Bill about this fish that he caught. You know, without waders, I probably would have stayed in bed. Or it would have been really uncomfortable and not lasted long. Missed the sunrise, missed the fishing with Bill and caught nothing. But waders were the secret to getting out amongst it. You know, and maybe a bit like what I'm talking about with waders is what happens when we change the ratio to more of God's word and less of fearing our problems. It sort of covers us and kits us out to be able to wade through the turbulent waters of life without being overwhelmed. We are filled with the warmth of God's love, his presence, his unshakable truths. That is what immersing in the Lord can do for us. Caleb had a different spirit because he immersed his mind in the Lord. You know, there's nothing better a parent can teach their children than to trust in God and his word. Moses taught the Israelites before they entered the promised land these words in Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your, our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Moses is saying, do whatever you can to impress love for the Lord on your children's minds and hearts. And this is like this call to intentionality. Because if we aren't making an impression, we need to know that every day, kids at school, TikTok, um, the culture around our kids is very intentionally seeking to make it impression. So we might try to protect them from the world, but that's not actually going to give them alone, going to give them what they need in this world. God's word gives them the waiters to enter into the world without the world entering into them. That's so important, what we hear here. And how? In everyday life, Moses was teaching, when you're sitting telling stories about God when you're walking, maybe when you're driving. I remember sometimes getting our kids to sit down for prayer time was almost impossible sometimes. But when we drove to the bus, that seemed to work for us. We prayed and made a habit of praying on the way to the bus. You know, you find there's things in your life that works for you. Um, visual symbols on the fridge, on the back of the toilet door where they can't miss. Worship songs playing, get them to church, get them to kids' ministry, get them to youth, saturate them as much as you can in God and show them in your life to imitate you and your faith. To see you praying with your spouse, reading your Bible, pretty much the same thing, pretty much the same things that work for us work for our kids. You know, life is hard. And we all face problems and challenges, but like Caleb, immersing in the Lord nine to one over problems and challenges grows our faith and lights the path to follow and fills our hearts with courage to claim what God promises. The second thing about Caleb is he waited patiently for God's promise. Caleb was given a promise 45 years earlier. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Caleb hung on to that promise from the Lord for 45 years. I mean, he would have recalled it many times 
When things got tough in the long wilderness years, he remembered it again. I'm going to inherit that land for my children and their children. It would have been easy to give up. I mean, we don't like waiting for 45 minutes for something, let alone 45 years. I must admit, I don't like waiting at the shops especially. Are you like me when you're at the shops? You're looking for the shortest line of the checkout. You're even counting how much stuff is in somebody's trolley and you want to get the fastest way through. You don't like waiting if you don't have to. Praise God for self-serve checkouts. Amen. But Caleb was a guy who knew how to wait. He knew God was faithful to his promises and his day would come. He didn't get bitter, even though he was trudging along with his rights, so he disobeyed God, even though he was paying for the sin of others. He remained focused and he persevered for the sake of his children. You know, there's two fruits of the Spirit when we become a Christian that God, God puts in our lives, patience and faithfulness. God's Spirit enables us to expect great things that he's doing, but also strengthens us for the journey as long as that may take. And like Caleb, he enables us to wait well without losing heart. We had to learn to wait as a church, didn't we? It took 14 years from when God gave us a promise that you're going to resettle abandoned cities and we open to when we open the doors of this building. But God taught us along the way how to wait well. And one of the best things we learned to do was to pray. Prayer is like watching while you're waiting. And at different points, the Holy Spirit inspired a prayer meeting. Our very first Easter prayer walk, we found this car mat on the ground and it said, pray always on it. And we took that as a sign and a call from God from year one, 2011. We had prayer for the battle. Not long after, we received um, the location of this land. When we lodged our DA in 2016, approval took some time. I remember one time standing along the, the fire trail praying for approval over the sewerage. I've never prayed so much for sewerage in all my life as we did as a church and rejoiced so much when that connection was made. And then this one up on the screen, we marked out the boundaries of the building. I think that was 2017 with, with, with lights right where this auditorium would be. And we looked at the promises God gave us with the eyes of faith. We worshipped knowing a worship centre would be built here one day. An expectation rose about what God will do as people prayed and we know God has promised this, but through the prayers of his people we would also see it. We imagine people streaming into church, lives being changed, God's glory emanating, grace flowing into the schools and the community around us, a city on a hill shining as a witness and an invitation to all who drive by. We can see it and now it's happening, church. God is faithful to his promises. Jesus' plans are unfolding and it's only the beginning. Things are going to open up more and more. Do you believe that today, church? In God's promise to Caleb, he said that it will also be for his children forever, and I'll bet that inspired him to wait. And I wonder if he could see it, generations following the Lord in Hebron. That's God's promise for our children forever too. There's another generation that are going to be blessed. Believe that. Tell them about the promises. Show them that we're holding on to them wholeheartedly. And the final thing that shaped this whole heart of Caleb is at the right time he claimed his inheritance. You know, while we wait for promises, the waiting comes to an end. There's, there's a time to claim, to claim the inheritance God has for us, the promise he gave us. Verse 12 says, um, Caleb said, Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day, said to Joshua. Verse 13, and then Joshua blessed Caleb and he gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb ever since because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba, after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. So Caleb asked for hill country promise to him, but then he took it from the Anakites. There was action required from him. He had to go into battle. And in 
chapter 15, 14, we read that he drove out the Anakites and in particular three descendants of the giant Anak. And, and then he gave his children that land. How mighty is that? And I particularly love verse 15 in brackets at the end of chapter 14 here. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Can you see the change of tense here? I mean, you often just skip over the bracketed words in the Bible. But the change of tense, for over four decades, Caleb had wanted to reclaim land of his inheritance. And as soon as he got permission, he drove out the Anakites, claimed the hill country, and their greatest warrior now appears as a footnote in some brackets. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba after their hero, but not anymore. God had a, has a promise and inheritance for you to claim, but you need to take it, the whole, to be wholehearted and commit to him. And in your story, the giants that made you afraid can be a footnote at the end. I used to be lost and crushed under a mountain of guilt. I used to be afraid of rejection and socially isolated. I used to be addicted to something too strong to break. I used to weep over my broken family. Fernie Grove and Upper Kedron used to have no church settled within them. But not anymore. I was found by Jesus who paid my debt and forgave my sins. God filled my heart with courage and gave me a church family. King Jesus set me free and now I'm addicted to him. God heard my prayers and tears of joy flowed at my family's baptisms. The grove stands as a city on a hill and a permanent witness to the love and hope of Jesus in these suburbs. Praise God. You know, what would you like to see written in your footnote here today? What in the future needs to be past tense? A used to be footnote because it's not that way anymore. Don't let fear hold you back from claiming what God wants to give you. Can you see it? Paul prayed in Ephesians 1, 8, 18 to 19, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Jesus came and he died and he rose again to give us everlasting life and a relationship with God. What an inheritance. Why would we want to settle for less than that? We need to open up our hearts fully so we can see our glorious inheritance and claim it. There is joy and peace and hope in measures you cannot imagine available to you, but we need to be all in. I remember I was all in when I asked Leanne to marry me at New Orleans All-You-Can-Eat Buffet on Queen Street Mall. She wasn't getting half the buffet. She was getting it all. Yeah. And so was I. Yeah. You've got to be all in. Yeah. You can't, you've got to be all in to become a Christian. You can't sort of be a half a Christian. I want half of Jesus and then half of um, the world. You know, I, I want it that both ways. We need to be all in. For us, like Caleb, we can say to God, give me that hill country that is promised to us. Maybe you've got a promise that you're waiting for. You keep telling God, give me that promise for your family, for your friends, for that thing that you haven't been able to overcome. Lord, I don't care how big the giants are, how hard the climb is, my heart is ready for the fight and I know you are greater than anything in the road. If you promise me this, then it's only a matter of taking it. Today you can stand in this church built in hill country and claim your inheritance in prayer today. A Caleb moment. Give me that hill country, that challenging landscape that is, and that bigger opposition because you are greater than this because the Lord is more than able to give that to me and my family. After Caleb took his inheritance, it says the land had peace from war. I mean, don't you long that peace in our lives and in our world in a world of hate and conflict and struggle well the day is coming 
when Jesus will end all wars and he will reign supreme. He's coming again and, and we will receive the fullness of what's been promised, eternal life. And until that great day, we can still experience incredible peace in our lives and claim back what has been stolen. God will help us to conquer fear, to defeat that enemy, to overcome that addiction, to restore that relationship, to lead that person to Christ, to succeed in that ministry of our calling, to finish well and leave a legacy where those after you continue the calling inspired because you followed the Lord your God wholeheartedly. So this is our moment this morning around the Lord's table which Henry's going to bring over for me. Thanks, Henry. <laughs> you know, today we've been remembering, we remembered 9-11, we've remembered the Queen, but more importantly, we need to remember our Saviour King Jesus today. And he gave us a way to do that best. And it's called the Lord's Supper here today. He did not let fear hold him back and stop him from leaving heaven and coming into this world to save us. He immersed himself in God and prayed, your will be done. He climbed the hill of Calvary and won the battle of our souls. He rose victoriously and claimed our inheritance into a living hope that will never fade or spoil. The author of life made our, own, own, made our old life a footnote. They used to be a captive to sin. And without hope, but not anymore. Now they are called my family, children of God. How great is God? How wonderful is the cross? What a saviour, what a legacy. And we eat and drink and we remember today. And in this moment, we can speak like Caleb. And I pray this is an opportunity for us to make a commitment today if you hear God's call to God in this moment to say, Lord, I want to live wholeheartedly for you to go after the promises and to claim my inheritance for the sake of those who come after me. Why don't we pray together, church? Lord, we just want to thank you so much, Jesus, as we come to a familiar meal. I pray this wouldn't be just a habit we're doing, a, a religious exercise, but Lord, we're meeting around the table the one who, who gave everything for us. As we eat the bread, Lord, we remember that your body was broken and torn and suffered and died for us. We thank you as we drink the cup that we remember that your blood was poured out so that we could be forgiven and our debts could be wiped out and we could be clean. Thank you for the amazing grace of God. And so we eat and we drink and we remember today that, oh, Jesus, we're inspired by you. We're inspired by Caleb. We're inspired by so many people we've witnessed who have not given up but fulfilled their calling and followed the Lord their God wholeheartedly. And, Lord, today we just want to say, Lord, I want to be in that number. This is a day when I come and I kneel before this throne of grace and I offer my life afresh, Lord. I pray that all of our lives would lead an incredible legacy for the generations after as we ask. We pray these things in Jesus' name.